We are seeing how the Holy Spirit moves within His believers. The remaining few, remember the church is about to die out, which is true. A lot of the Bible believers uh, dying out, become extinct, became apostate. But then there are a few names that have not died out. We discussed Wycliffe, Huss, and now we're coming to Savonarola. Uh, now this is in uh, Dr. Upman's History of the New Testament Church. And this will be found on page 408. Page 408. His name is uh, Girolamo Savonarola. Now he is more Catholic, if my memory serves me right, than Wycliffe and Huss. However, he was not really a good Catholic during his days as well. Amen. And he was the one that stuck out his neck against the corruption of the Roman Catholic Empire that time. And the way he talks sounds very similar to the Bible believers. Now remember, you have to uh, give these Bible believers a break because the teaching that the only Christian teaching they knew at that time, if you might recall, was only, uh, was only Catholic doctrine. And then the Bible believers, they were very few and far be, uh, between. So Savonarola, he was the man that was actually trying to follow his best according to the Bible-believing movement. And who are the Bible-believing movement? Those who are closest to the Bible. And he was one of those people who were closest to the Bible that was anti-Catholic. Usually when you're anti-Catholic, then you find your crowd during that time, if you might recall. They're the ones that are the closest to that time. So, covering Savonarola, here are the following pointers that you want to know about him, where he is more of a Bible believer than Catholic based on uh, these points, based on these pointers right here. The first point is that he sympathized with the Bohemian Brethren, who were the descendants of the Bulgarians and Paulicians. Do you remember those guys? So you remember those were the good guys back in the old days. It keeps reading, according to Dr. Upman, Bohemia has been called the cradle of the Reformation. Remember, Bohemia was where John Huss started his movement, and then the Hussites came out. And these Bible-believing people had just experienced a sudden swelling in their ranks at the time of Ziska, at 1420, a Bohemian soldier, and a king whose followers were known as Taborites. There is no doubt about the Taborites' theology. They rejected infant baptism, so that's pretty important. That's pretty important to realize. And didn't accept one single teaching by any church father where it conflicted with scripture which they had. So the Bohemian brethren are important. And by the way, they're going to be important later on when you hear about their missions. When you hear about their missions. It keeps reading, 50 years before Wycliffe's Bible was printed, there were four editions... So this is 50 years before Wycliffe's Bible. Remember, there were all handwriting Bibles that time, the English Bible. 50 years prior to Wycliffe's Bible was printed, there were four editions of the Bohemian Bible in use in Bohemia. In 1498, the Bohemian Brethren published their own Bible. So you can see here that the Word of God was spreading out. In the second place, when it came to religious liberty and love for the Bible, Savonarola would have to be called a heretic for no pope loved either, which is very, very true. Third place, Savonarola said that Pope Boniface VIII, so he is very anti-pope. What did he say about his majesty? Such wonderful things like a loyal Catholic would? Well, Pope Boniface VIII, was a wicked man who began his reign like a fox and ended it like a dog. <laughs> this blew out several fuse boxes at one time, but Savonarola went on and added that if God's presence left a pope, that pope was nothing but a broken tool. Upon this, the vicar of Christ did the only thing with Savonarola that a good, godly, humble Christian man would do. He had the preacher 
tortured for two months and then burned him at the stake. So you can see that he was not a very good Catholic, Savonarola. Some introductory notes concerning about Savonarola. He was uh, found on page 408, was an Italian reformer born in Ferrara, Italy. He left home to enter a Domini uh, uh, Dominican monastery in 1474. There he studied the Bible and the works of Augustine. Being raised on these two conflicting authorities, Savonarola never did attain to the evangelistic and biblical level of his contemporaries, which is the Waldensians, the Lollards, and Hussites. Remember those guys? So he didn't meet up to their standard. However, he became a great preacher of righteousness. So he's kind of like Chrysostom. Remember the church father Chrysostom? So he is uh, very empathetic, sympathetic toward his Antiochian, so to speak, peers. Uh, that those groups of people around those areas. So he's kind of like Chrysostom, who's basically more Bible-believing and more prone to anti-Catholic, even though he was still part of the Catholic movement. And spoke out boldly, he spoke out boldly against the evils of Roman Catholic priests and bishops until he had Italy in an uproar. The city of Florence, northern Italy, the home of the Paterines, Waldenges, and Frat uh, Fratricelli, assumed the proportions of Calvin's Geneva under this preaching, and in a vain attempt to shut him up, this is important, Pope Alexander VI offered him a cardinal's hat, which is a red hat, obviously. Savonarola replied that he would take a red hat, all right, yeah. one made out of blood. Yeah. That's how he replied. During the Sardis period, and by the way, do you know what uh, Sardis is referring to? The red ones. The red ones. So that fits pretty well for Savonarola. During the Sardis period, the red ones... Savonarola had no delusions about the proper place for a Bible-believing Christian who was preaching against the sins of Rome. So when he was tortured for two months and then condemned to be burned at the stake, this is a good one for some of you who have already heard me say this before, but I'll read it from Dr. Upman's book on page 410. When Savonarola was tied to the stake, the Pope's prelate said to him, quote, I separate thee from the church militant and the church triumphant. Now, for some of you who don't know, the church uh, militant is referring to the church on earth. Because why? We are in warfare. So we are battling. It's a military. The church is a military. I don't know if you knew that church. So the church militant. The church triumphant is referring to in heaven. Because why? We got the victory. As the Bible says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So basically, the priest was saying, I separate you from the church completely, whether on earth or in heaven. So pay attention to now what Savonarola said. Savonarola replied back to that, uh, that Pope's prelate, Not from the church triumphant. That is not thine to do. So what he replied was basically, no, not, you can't separate me from heaven. That's what he said. No, I know where I'm going when I die. I'm going to heaven when you burn me at the stake. So that's what he said. His last words were, Jesus, Jesus, to make sure that no sympathetic bystanders uh, might mistake his death for the death of a Christian martyr, because he kept saying Jesus, Jesus as his last words, what did the Catholic Church do? Savonarola's corpse was burned to ashes, and the ashes were thrown into the Arno River. Just like Wycliffe, remember? That's what happened to his dead court, and they threw it on the uh, Elbe River, if I recall. That was the name. So Luther said later, so this is the famous Martin Luther. What did he say? It was God who canonized... Oh, yikes. Oh, I just lost it. I said, oh... For, thank you, thank you. Let me find it back here. Okay. 
Luther said later that it was God who canonized Savonarola, made a saint out of him. The moral quality of the Roman Catholic Church spirituality is not hard to ascertain when one notes that they canonized the head of the Inquisition, Dominic, but would not canonize Savonarola. Why? Because he's such a blatant heretic. But that's how the Lord mightily used Savonarola at that time. So these are the Bible believers during the time of Sardis. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, it is definitely an evil inquisition and system. Amen. Now, the inquisition, for some of you who don't know, it was a dreadful, torturous system that was approved by one of your evil popes. And basically, uh, all you have to do is read Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, as well as even research online, and I'll just tell you some of the stuff that I know from memory, is that basically what they would do is that uh, when they torture you, they had too many torturous devices that is too like grotesque and it is sick. Uh, next to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know anything that was more painful and even worse. Uh, combine all the communist persecutions and the Nazi persecutions, the Holocaust, everything, uh, the Inquisition was the worst of the bunch. And what they did was they uh, sprinkled holy water on all the torture devices, and they were doing it all in the name of God. Why? Because they wanted God's blessing when they tortured the people. That was just purely evil and wicked. That was purely evil and wicked. Torture people for hours, months, and years. And even little children. So they had no mercy. They had no mercy. They were an evil, wicked system. So here are some things to know concerning about the Inquisition and the Roman Catholic system that time. So the Roman Catholic power, they were wiping out Savonarola, the Waldensians, Huss, Wycliffe. And by wiping them out, they seemed to have succeeded. Because remember, Sardis is a time period where it seems like it's dying out, right? So it seems like it's dying out. But we have to understand that when things seem to be dying out, that the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they assumed that they would be growing more in power and that they were being more tyrannical against the world. And it was a dark time. So I'm going to describe the darkness. Remember, it's a dead time period, okay? So I'm going to describe the darkness of this time. If we're going to look at page 251 on Widowson's book, all right, the, Frederick Widowson's book, again, a Bible believer looks at world history. That's the name of his book. On page 251, it reads, the conflict between the church and the Holy Roman Empire reached a compromise at the Concordat of Worms in 1122 between Pope Calixtus II and the Emperor Henry V. Henry, who had forced his unfortunate father, Henry IV, why? The father, Henry IV, had spent three days standing shoeless in the snow, begging a pope to reverse his excommunication from the church back in 1076 to abdicate in 1105. So the papacy was very powerful, as you might know. Henry V gave up the right to invest or create bishops and abbots and recognized that only the church had that right. Of course, most of the kings of Europe still continued to pick who would be a bishop in their territory. Kings and churchmen often collided on the subject of who would be pope, and there were those who backed one and then the other in bitter disputes over power. So you can see right here during this time period that popes bishops and kings were all fighting for power. So it was just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It was just a money-hungry system. So it didn't matter if they were a religious church. The religious church was just as power as the empires, you have to understand, the kingdoms. So it was a dark time period. At times, a holy Roman emperor like Frederick Bar Barbarossa would make a pope and at other times, he would be forced to kiss a pope's feet, which Frederick did after the Battle of Legnano, humbling himself as Henry II of England was forced to do when he walked barefoot to the tomb of Becket 
to receive discipline from the canons of Canterbury. You look at this. This is totally nonsensical. It's wicked. So that's, that's the power of the Catholic system of that time. They would have kings and rulers on their knees. The same Pope, Alexander III, caused both monarchs to humiliate themselves in these situations. The papacy was a constant swirl of plotters and diabolic intrigue, and some of the worst of it was from the 11th to the 13th century. Dr. Ludwig Pastor's 1906 work, The History of the Popes, Volume the First, says it this way, quote, the disastrous struggle between the highest powers of Christendom, which began in the 11th century and reached its climax in the 13th, was decided apparently to the advantage of the papacy by the tragic downfall of the house of Hohenstaufen. End of quote. Please note how all historians equate the Christian in history before the Reformation as being synonymous with the Catholic in history, which we already know. The Holy Roman Empire started by Charlemagne and the papacy were constantly at odds and with the weakness of the empire, the popes had to look more to France for support. So began the 14th century or the 1300s. So the 11th to 13th centuries, we can see that this was an extremely dark time of corruption of the popes. And then when we hit down later, this is Sardis, remember? So this was definitely a dead time period. It was a, d a days of darkness. Then we go on to uh, further beyond. Then France is within the picture here. The attention of the Catholic system. What's going on? Clement V was a native of France. After being crowned Pope, afraid of the constant turmoil and warfare in Italy and influenced by the French king, Philip the Fair, he stayed in France and never set foot in Rome. Okay, so that's pretty... What a good Pope, you know, he stayed in France, didn't stay in Rome. He reigned as Pope from 1305 to 1314. His successor, John XXII, also from France, was elected after much controversy in 1316 with the papacy or holy see being vacant for two years. He took up permanent abode in Avignon, France, just across the Rhone River from the French king like his predecessor. So you can see that uh, they decided to stick around France and they didn't want to go to Rome. When Clement V moved the papacy to Avignon, oh, what a good thing that a pope would do. Move it from the capital city, the, the holy city where God is supposed to reign. <laughs> Move the papacy to Avignon. You notice that these Catholic popes, they just did whatever they want to do. It's power. Yeah. It's, not it's not going by uh, what is spiritual and what is right, let alone religious. It's all their whims. Durant tells us there began the 68 years of Babylonian captivity of the popes once the papacy was moved to Avignon. So let's see what happened here. The papacy had freed itself from Germany, but surrendered to France. So remember, uh, I don't know if you recall, but remember Germany, that empire, was very powerful because of... Oh, I forgot his uh, name. I can't believe it. Uh, Otto. Yeah, the Otto Empire. So remember the Otto Empire... So uh, they were finally freed from the cl clutches of the Germanic terrain, but now it's going to France. And let's keep reading onward here. It says, uh, it freed itself from Germany, but surrendered to France. Clement, according to Durant, was a weak tool of the French king, implying that the Avignon popes were tools of the French king. Dr. Pastor disagrees in his book if that is applied to all of the Avignon popes, saying that the statements about the weakness of the popes at Avignon are unjust, although he does admit that Clement wasn't a strong pope. Okay, either way, they were just weaklings. So. It was under Clement V that the papal bull calling on the king of France to destroy the Knights Templars was made. So that's kind of interesting. 
Pastor tells us, though, that the move from the natural home of the popes of Rome to France was a disaster for the papacy. Obviously, he is a good Catholic as he laments how the popes lost prestige while in France. It is true that it was strange for the popes who had so been used to rebuking kings and princes were now almost subject to one. So over here they were uh, powerful and now over here they were just like, oh, they were surrendering to the whims of France that time. The Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV, with the excuse of freeing the popes from the constant struggles between France and England, worked hard to bring the papacy back to Rome. Urban V, Pope from 1362 to 1370, almost did just that. So they almost got the papacy back to Rome. This emperor made a pilgrimage to Rome, and unlike previous German leaders, he formed a good relationship with the papacy. Okay, so remember the Holy Roman Empire, thanks to the autos that time that the devil used, so he was able to try to bridge something, and he was able to get the pope back. So let's just keep reading here. Rome was in decay without the popes, and the papal palaces were in ruins, which it should be. <laughs> Urban went back to Avignon and died before any permanent move back to Rome could be accomplished. Gregory XI did move the papacy back to Rome, after much difficulty with those oppo opposing the move and with much fanfare. So finally they get back to Rome. After their humiliation and their low-down moments. It was during this time. It seems pretty appropriate because Sardis was a time period of deadness, as you might recall. As we continually read on here, the next great event in Roman Catholic Church history is no so he says great as, you know, so-called, is known as the Papal Schism of 1378 to 1417. All right, so let me write that down here. That's an important time. So what happened here? It says, uh, it reads here, When the plans for reforming the church by Urban VI made Charles V of France angry, yeah, because France lost their power. No, we want you back. <laughs> and hoping to drag the papacy, kicking and screaming back to Avignon, he supported some renegade cardinals in electing Robert of Geneva as Pope Clement VII. Oh, how wonderful now. Oh, the Roman Catholic Church, you really trust the system? Why? Because it's founded on Peter, unbreakable chains of Pope. Look at this. Laughable, man. Everybody grabbing a piece of the Roman Catholic Church and claiming they're the real church of Jesus Christ. It's broken. Once again, the papacy was in a turmoil the kings of various countries at war would align with the Pope that most suited their cause, of course. Now, this is not mentioned, but um, I think this is mentioned in my discipleship videos long ago when I was reading Pastor Donovan's article about the anti-church history of the Popes. Uh, if I did read that, then I'm just going to say it right here. Basically, if I did read it, it would go this way, where Pastor Donovan mentioned that there were, they ended up having three different popes. And then uh, John Wycliffe, remember, the Morning Star of the Reformation, he mocked saying, you know, I always knew that the pope was cloven-footed, like the devil, right? Yeah. But now he's cloven-headed, that's what he said. Why? Because the pope is supposed to be the head of the church. Yeah, so... So the church is very laughable that time, the Roman Catholic Church, and it's not even a church, actually. One of the less uh, endearing efforts of the church in this period was the Inquisition. So that's a dark time period, which began as a way of dealing with heretics like you and I, who viewed the scripture as their final authority. And that man was not saved by the sacraments of any church, by, but by the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. After 1227, Gregory IX set up several special inquisitores to pursue heresy. He favored the Dominican order of monks so heavily for this task that they became known as the hunting dogs of the Lord. So the Dominicans were the evil people this time, used by the Inquisition.
Now, more about this information, it, it reads, The Dominicans were founded by Catholic Saint Dominic, a Spaniard born in 1170. The Inquisition is purely and uniquely a Catholic institution. The office of the Inquisition was changed to the name of Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in 1965 after having been renamed Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office in 1908. Really? Supreme Sacred? That's evil, man, torturing people like that. That's evil, man. You know this is Satan's church then. There's no doubt. This cannot be the Christian church. Ask these... Uh, I don't understand these Catholic apologists. Ask them this. How can you put faith in a church that's, unfound, that's undoubtedly founded by evil? Bring up the Inquisition. Tell them you think that's God's church. That's got to be Satan's church. No doubt about it. The Pope at this writing, Benedict the uh, 16th, a.k.a. Joseph Ratzinger, if you might recall, was in charge of that office from 1981. Didn't you know that? How about that? Before we had our Pope Francis. But anyway, the medieval inquisition, one of four, so it's one of four, did its job. It stamped out Catharism in France, uh, if you recall the Cathars, and drove the Waldensians to the remotest hills, if you recall the Waldensians, now they've been driven out, postponing the Reformation by three centuries. That's why it's known as Sardis. The Inquisition did its work. It drove them all out. It's an evil system. In Spain, the Inquisition played a minor role before 1300. According to Durant and Northern Italy, contained many Bible-believing Christians in spite of its efforts right up to the Reformation. So Northern Italy, it would still contain the Bible-believing Christians. That's where Savonarola got his influence, if you might recall. Uh, Wycliffe got his influence by these people. And then Huss got influenced by Wycliffe. So these uh, Waldensian people, the Vaudois, they are very important for your Baptist history, you have to understand. They became later Anabaptists. These Vaudois were something else. They are undoubtedly a part of a Bible-believing chain of Baptist history back then. Okay, so... Oh, man, that's the devil. Okay, if someone can turn that off. Okay. I've been, my phone was ringing that too, actually. So, uh, I don't know uh, why it's still ringing. <laughs> okay, so we see right here that this is the Roman Catholic uh, system of that time. Now, um, before we continue on, I want you to go to Genesis 6. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. We're going to go back to Britain, the British Isles. So there's an important event in history during this time while the Roman Catholic Church was growing in darkness. You might recall King Arthur, and I explained some things where it might have been possible that some remaining bloodline or remnant of the sons of God or Nephilim continued on through King Arthur, and then that's why we get these Arthurian legends and some interesting mythological, fantastical tales about it. It might be connected uh, with Genesis 6 again, but there's a person who could carry on from uh, King Arthur, so to speak. It could carry on from that Nephilim bloodline and continue onward. But as you might know, as we get later and later in the centuries, the Nephilim, the sons of God bloodline, is getting more and more rare. So then it's deteriorating. You might recall I mentioned in my previous teaching that it's very likely when they were driven off to Britain because they're trying to get in the furthest part of the landmass right, away from Israel, and then they cross the ocean to get in the other furthest side of the landmass, the Americas, which is why the later centuries in the Americas, you still hear these gods and these tales and these stories. So that's possible. But the la uh, remaining uh, remnant that's lingering and very, very rare, it could have continued during the time of Sardis. And then what we're going to look at is the famous William Wallace.
So he was definitely Scotland's hero, and he's very important to Scottish history against England of that time. So we're, uh, some of this stuff will be obviously from Britannica, as well as some of the research that I did myself that you can confirm through your own research. William Wallace, it is very interesting, some notes about him. It reads here, uh, William Wallace in full, it would be Sir William Wallace, born 1270, probably near Paisley, Renfrew, Scotland, died August 23rd, 1305, London, England. Chief inspiration for Scottish resistance to the English King Edward I. He served as guardian of the Kingdom of Scotland during the first years of the long and ultimately successful struggle to free his country from English rule. Okay, so some stories about it is this. Basically what happened is that there was a uh, Scottish king and then when there was a Scottish king, John de Balliol, King Edward I of England actually deposed and imprisoned him. So Edward I. So then Scotland's king was imprisoned and Edward I from England was basically taking control. There were, during that time, several guardians, what they called the guardians. So then Scotland that time had their guardians set up and then these guardians were the ones that can champion and can resist and had the power against Edward I. But then there was unknowingly a man somewhere from nowhere that came out and was able to help out the guardians. William Wallace, some people uh, conjecture concerning about his early history, is that when they look at um, his uh, emblem, they notice that it would be an archer. And because of his uh, brilliance, and his courage in battle, they wonder where did he learn that from. So then they conjecture that he may have been in Edward I's army back then. And he may have been an archer that time. So that's their guess. Concerning more about uh, William Wallace, they say that according to some reports that uh, he is tall as a giant and they say as tall as one person accounted seven feet tall. Coming from, coming from uh, an area where there was some sons of God remnant and bloodline and trace through King Arthur, it may be possible that William Wallace may have carried that in some way in some bloodline or form. Now, we see in Genesis 6 that it is the case that great legendary heroes, that they tend to be connected to sons of God bloodline. So we've seen that with Arthur, and then probably with William Wallace as well. If we look at Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says at verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, so when those aliens intermingled with the humans, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. So you get your tales of heroes. So it may have been possible about Wallace. There are some tales and there are some, uh, I guess you can call it myths or legends uh, surrounding Wallace. So we don't know how much is true or false, but if there is some substance behind Wallace, uh, behind some of those tales and those incredible accounts, then we can attribute that to Genesis 6 because it was around that same terrain where I told you very possible the sons of God retreated at the British Isles that time. But then they were retreating to the Americas. So then their bloodline was becoming more rare, rare, rare. And then Wallace may have been that, rare, uh, that rarity that carried, carried it on in some way or form. But anyway, this is all just uh, theoretical, but I'm trying to look at a spiritual historical standpoint. What's Satan doing that time? And then what the church is doing that time? So that's why I'm looking throughout all possibilities what's going on. What are those sons of God thinking? What are the demonic spirits doing during this time? 
What is the church doing this time? So what we do know is that those spiritual uh, evil beings, that they were fleeing, uh, it looked like they were fleeing more toward an area where they would be, uh, they would be abstract, they would be oblivious, mysterious, so that it wouldn't catch public eye. Because once they catch public eye, then you recall what God did. He sent Noah's flood. You recall what he did. He sent the Israelites to wipe them out. So that's why they had to get away from mankind and humanity. But the devil was able to corrupt through the church. So through the church, he was able to create the, Roman, the evil Roman Catholic system. It's ugly monster and head. Now, uh, continuing on here, let's read more about uh, Wallace. So then he was the one who brought up the resistance. Sporadic resistance had already occurred when in May 1297, Wallace and a band of some 30 men burned Lanark and killed its English sheriff. So then they first killed the English sheriff and now the first battle came out. The Scottish steward, Robert the Bruce, he later became King Robert the I. So Robert the Bruce is important because he was very helpful and I can see the time ticking. So let me wrap up the... the brave heart history real quickly, okay? <laughs> Let's read this quickly here. All right. So Wallace, he next marched on Scone, drove out the English, uh, just, uh, he drove out the English and attacked the English garrisons between the rivers Forth and Tay. Robert the Bruce and others now gathered an army, but it was forced to surrender at Irvine by Sir Henry de Percy and Sir Robert de Clifford. So Robert the Bruce needed help, and Wallace was the man who was there to the rescue. Wallace, however, remained in action with a large company in the forest of Selkirk, according to a contemporary report made to Edward. Wallace laid siege to Dundee, but abandoned it to oppose with Andrew de Moray, an English army that was advancing towards Stirling under John de Warren, Earl of Surrey. Surrey failed to bring Wallace to terms outside Stirling. And what happened? On the morning of September 11, 1297, the English began to file across the narrow bridge over the Forth. Now, for some of you who don't know, this bridge was very narrow. And what happened was, is that because the English army just kept marching on this narrow bridge, even though the English army was mighty and probably even outnumbered much more in numbers and power, because of this narrow bridge, what happened was that uh, Moray, who was joining with Wallace, they held back their troops until half the English had crossed that narrow bridge. And once they did that, they finally attacked with such sudden fury. And then what happened was is that they were killing and wiping out the English that the bridge was just, uh, it was just being too much with the English all over there and they were running and chaos was spreading that the, the bridge even collapsed, actually. So then the English were definitely wiped out. In fact, uh, one of the gruesome things, if it's true or not, is that when William Wallace uh, won his uh, war, he took uh, one of the, I think it was the treasurer of King, Henry, of King Henry I, and then what he did was that he flayed him, and then he used his skin as part of his uh, weapons covering, actually. So Wallace was brutal, actually. In fact, uh, when uh, Edward was, uh, King Edward was chasing after Wallace, what he would do is just wipe out the towns and the cities when he was retreating. You know why? That way Edward's army don't get their uh, rations, their refreshment. So Wallace, he was just like brutal. He was just going onward. So, but that's how he won his battles. Uh, he became obviously guardian of Scotland because of uh, his uh, victories. But that's the only reason why the Guardians put up with him. The Guardians didn't like, uh, they didn't really approve Wallace. They only allowed him to be Guardian because of his victories. And then what happened was, is that King Edward, he did, uh, when he kept chasing after William Wallace, he did uh, ch reach one point and won the battle against Wallace. So when Wallace suffered that defeat, then he went a wall, and he wasn't considered to be that position of guardian. However, there were rumors that uh, William Wallace, that he would uh, seek help from France that time. So then he would go to France and then seek their help, and then try to get his power going and try to defeat the English through French connections. 
However, what eventually happened was that uh, William Wallace, that uh, he was finally captured. When he was finally captured, uh, King Edward uh, condemned him guilty of treason against the king. But William Wallace replied, you know, the king, uh, he was never my king to begin with. So I wasn't part of that nation to begin with. Because he wanted to start his own freedom, his own nation. Now Wallace, uh, how he died was very brutal. They stripped him naked. They dragged him on the end of a horse. And then while dragging him on the end of the horse naked, then they hung him. And then as they hung him, then they made sure that he became alive. And then uh, they emasculated him. Then they uh, disemboweled him. And then they finally, if I, my memory serves me, then they finally beheaded him. So he went through a lot of torture, actually. So Wallace was greatly tortured. Then they took his uh, severed limbs and spread it out through several cities. As an example, to not mess with England. However, what happened, if you look at uh, Widdowson's book again, if you can take out Widdowson's book again. Okay, so if we look at page 257, Robert Bruce, approximately like two years later, why this guy is important is he was the one that was able to help Scotland win, finally, against English tyranny. So on page 257, in 1306, Robert Bruce, who was the grandson of one of an earlier claimant to the throne and had fought under Edward at... Falkirk against Wallace, so he was originally against Wallace. What happened though is switched, led a revolt from 1307 to 1314. At first using guerrilla tactics, he pushed the English back to where they only controlled Stirling, Dunbar, and Berwick. In order to rescue Stirling, which Robert Bruce had put under siege, Edward took the field against him in 1314 leading an army of nearly 60,000 men, so that's a lot, against Robert Bruce. He met Robert Bruce and his much, much smaller army at a stream called Bannock, uh, Bannockburn. There, one of the most amazing battles in the British Isles took place, in which the battle book by Brian Perrett tells us the Scots won a decisive vic victory which secured Scottish independence. Harper's Encyclopedia of Military History claims losses for the English of at least 15,000. So that's how the English suffered their defeat, 15,000. Uh, Sir Charles Oman, in his The Art of War in the Middle Ages, says that it was the worst loss ever suffered by the English army in the Middle Ages. So this was probably the worst English defeat. You might recall that they had their Hundred Years' War with France, right? And they were superior, and they seemed to be powerful, but now they suffered their worst defeat, and it was under the Scots. Don't mess with the seven-foot-tall people, right? All right. Don't mess with Max's group. Okay, so they're very scary people. When, <laughs> when uh, Edward attempted another invasion, Robert defeated him at the Battle of Bylan in 1322. Scottish independence was formally recognized at Peace of Northampton in 1328. And Robert, just when they won their independence, he died a year after that. So that's the Scottish history that time. All right. Uh, next, in our world history class, we're going to cover two most important things that changed all of world history. Before Luther came out with his mighty reformation that changed world history, there were two other things before him that was needful, that really spread out, that contributed to the reformation and Bible-believing Philadelphia church age to spread out. And that was because of the New World uh, exploration. So we're going to look at the exploration of the New World, but there was a second thing that was very rampant that we're going to see later on in history became a de very hot, debatable issue, and that's slavery. All right, so we're going to see these two things, interesting things, in our next, next history class. God, my Father, I pray that tonight's uh, discipleship was a blessing to the hearers and bless the next Bible study. It's going to be very fun, Lord, the next Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.